Continuation, Application of the Perfect Redemption Plan, Part 6, page 102. Continuing with Chapter 3, 1, Love. I hide nothing from you, and I am transparent about my past life and my present life. I disclose everything to you, my moments of shame and my moments of glory and honor, because I trust you with my life, that you will not betray me nor condemn me for my mistakes of the past. As the Bible says, and Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Genesis 2 verse 23 to 25 In the book of Songs of Solomon, the Shulamite also brings her beloved into her mother's house, even into the chamber where she was born. As it is written, Scarcely I have passed by the watchman when I found the one I love. I held him and would not let him go, until I had brought him to the house of my mother, and into the chamber or room of her, my mother, who conceived me. Songs 3 verse 4 So you see, it was not just man who brought his bride into the chamber where he was conceived by his mother, but the woman also brought her bridegroom into the room where she was conceived. My people becomes your people. You have access to all the family secrets. I hide nothing from you. My mother is your mother. My father is your father. My brothers are your brothers, and my sisters are your sisters. As you read your Bible, you will see examples of saints relating with their family members, sons, daughters, wife, husbands, and in-laws. Take the good example and apply them to your family and in-laws. Study the bad ones and purpose never to reproduce them in your life. All the Bible studies we have are to tell us how the Godhead loves us and treats us. We are married to the resurrected Christ and Israel is married to God. Therefore treat and love each other in your home the way the Godhead treats us. The friendship kind of love, of filial love, is very important. In John 21, when Jesus meets his disciples who went fishing, he asked Peter three times, Do you love me? The first time and the second time, Jesus was asking Peter, Do you agape love me, or do you unconditionally love me? Peter knew that he did not love Jesus unconditionally, so he answered both times, I love you like a friend, or I filio love you. The third time Jesus questioned even if Peter loved him like a friend, or filio loved him. That is why Peter was grieved and said, You know all things. You know that I love you like a friend, or I filio love you. John 21 verse 17 the standards of friendship are different in the kingdom of God. Please read the Bible study, The Heart of a Son or Daughter Serving the Father as the Father's Friend, to know what friendship is like in the kingdom of God, and go and do likewise. There is no hidden agenda in friendship. Whether we are poor or rich, it does not matter. The friendship is still on. Either we are in power or we are removed from power. The friendship is still on. A friend sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs 18 verse 24 A friend loves at all times. Proverbs 17 verse 17 The friendship between Jonathan and David was at all times. Even when Saul wanted to kill David, Jonathan remained friends with David. Saul was Jonathan's father, but the hatred and personal issues that Saul had against David never affected the true friendship that Jonathan had for David.
Even in church, some people who call themselves your friend, when they discover that the pastor has a problem against you, they do not want to associate with you in church, for they do not want to offend the pastor. When they are talking to you, immediately they see the pastor's wife, they walk away. They call you on the phone to talk to you for hours about their problem so that you can pray for them, but in church they will never greet you nor stand and talk to you, for they do not want people to know that they associate with you. My friends, these people are not your friends. Jonathan did not do that to David. The Bible tells us Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan and he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own confusion and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, you shall not be established nor your kingdom. And now send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan answered Saul his father and said to him, Why shall he be killed? What has he done? And Saul threw a spear at him to strike him, and by this Jonathan knew that his father was determined to kill David. And Jonathan rose from the table in fierce anger and did not eat food on the second day of the new moon, for he was grieved for David because his father had put him to shame. 1 Samuel 20, verse 30 to 34. Jonathan was no longer in the favor of Saul because of his friendship with David. His own father wanted to kill him because of his friendship with David. Someone who is ashamed to associate with you in public and professes to be your friend is not your friend. You are his friend, but he is not your friend for he does not reciprocate your friendship. Christians who are ashamed of Jesus and his words in public are not reciprocating his friendship. And Jesus tells them, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels, Luke 9, verse 26. Jonathan was ready to lose his life at the hand of his father Saul over his friendship for David. Greater love has no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant does not know what his Lord does. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. John 15 verse 13 to 15 If your friend is wrong, you must tell him that he is wrong, and you must tell the people around you that you know that your friend is wrong. Yet you so love your friend that you continue to talk some truth in love into his life so that he can repent. When Jesus says, You are my friends, if you do whatever I command you, this only applies to our friendship with Jesus Christ, because he is always true, never wrong. Some people will tell you, If you are my friend, you will support me in whatever I decide to do. This is only true if what you have decided to do is right. In marriage, some couples have that wrong understanding. They will say to their spouse, You are supposed to back me up, to support me in whatever I do or say, for you are my spouse. So, if that spouse is a quarrelsome person, they expect their spouse not to talk to the people they are quarrelling with. So that is why in some churches, when the pastor's wife is a quarrelsome person or an insecure person, church members do not chit-chat in the church with members whom the pastor's wife does not approve. And the husband, since he has the wrong understanding of what it means to support his wife, thinks that because it is his wife he must do everything she dictates or vice versa if he is the pastor in charge.
He ignores the counsel of the scriptures and the counsel of all the other associate pastors taken during the meeting to implement the counsel of his wife, vice versa if it is a wife that is the pastor in charge. He belittles the other pastor's counsel and the counsel of the scriptures. When things go awry, he calls a meeting of all the pastors and tells them what we decided to do is not working. But the other pastors know that what was implemented was not what they concluded at the meeting. So though they pray together, there is no agreement. This is not a prayer of agreement. There is now hypocrisy in the church. People will tell each other, do not bother advising the pastor or making a contribution during the leadership meeting, even if God is the one who told you that message, for after the meeting he will only do what his wife tells him. Many pastors' wives have hijacked the church of God, for when their husbands do not implement their suggestions, they are very angry, and there is no peace at home. So for the sake of the peace at home, the husband does whatever the wife suggests for the church. This is a Jezebel spirit. She is manipulative, and the man has an Ahab spirit. If you also want to bring your wife into the leader's meeting and let all the decisions be taken openly, if she has a contribution to make, let everybody in leadership hear it and judge it, like they judge every other thing that is done in the church according to the word of God. Let the church pray over all those decisions and decide by the leading of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures which contributions should be implemented into the church and which ones should not. After that meeting, the pastor should not implement something else. It is an insult to the other leaders and to the Holy Spirit, for there has been hypocrisy. You never intended to implement any advice of your leadership which lines up with the Holy Scriptures. May God help our churches that the Ahab and Jezebel spirits will not take over the church. David was a shepherd boy who had nothing to offer to a prince like Jonathan. If someone is getting close to you because of what you can do for him, he is not your genuine friend. The moment you lose that position of power, he'll no longer be around you. If we decide to walk in the agape love of God, friendship kind of love will flow naturally, for agape love is greater than filio love and storage love. Jesus says, No one has greater love than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. John 15 verse 13 Jonathan exhibited agape love when he was ready to die at the hand of his father Saul over the friendship he had with David. Let us read again what Jesus tells us. No one has greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants. For the servant does not know what his master does. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, so that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you shall ask of the father in my name, he may give it to you. John 15, verse 13 to 16. First of all, according to Jesus, when you are friends with someone, that person will be willing to lay down his life for you. Jesus said he is our friend, and he demonstrated it by laying down his life for us. Let us repeat it again. We only give that type of friendship and loyalty to Jesus. Yes, People have been martyred for Jesus. People have been imprisoned for not denying Jesus. People have been fired from their places of work because they preached the gospel and yet they have not denied Jesus. They have truly reciprocated the friendship that Jesus has toward them. They did whatever Jesus commanded them. 
Now, if you have a friend and they are doing what is wrong or sinful according to the written word of God, do not follow them, nor condone what they are doing, but tell them the truth in love and pray for them. If a person bails out on you when you are in trouble and only comes back when you are prosperous, that person is not your friend. Second, a friend shares secrets with you and confides in you. Jesus says, I have called you friends for all things. Even if you have a close friend, only tell them all things about you and your life with Jesus. Yes, you can confide in your friend, yet your outside friends must not know more about you than your spouse. Your spouse must be, after Jesus, your best friend. Even your pastor or the person who disciples you should not know more about you than your spouse. Even when there has been adultery, you confess it to God and to the minister of the gospel or your disciples to be able to help you through it, and you must also confess it to your spouse according to the scriptures. I talked to some couples who were on the verge of divorce. A man told me, my wife does not support me in my decisions, so I made some financial investments. I called my pastor and he prayed for me about them. Weeks later, I told my wife, and she was angry. That pastor should not have prayed for you. He should have told you. Have you told your spouse about those investments? There must be total transparency in couples. Finance is the number one cause of divorce worldwide, and adultery is only the second cause of divorce. Another man told me when his sister-in-law, who was not married, was pregnant, she would call him and he would go with her to the clinic to have the abortion. She aborted three pregnancies. He never told his wife what was going on, for he swore to his sister-in-law not to tell her sister his wife. When his wife got to know what had happened, it destroyed the trust in their marriage, and she wanted a divorce. I told him he must be born again. Read the Bible study on David's sexual sin exposed. You cannot be best friends with your sister-in-law and be holding her hand while she is having the abortions. The wife accused him of being the father of those children her sister aborted. Even if he denies it, it is his word against the word of his wife. He went to see a pastor who, instead of pointing them to the Holy Scriptures, asked them to solve the things traditionally. So the parents of the wife fined him £500 for the abortion which he paid. If he was not the father of those children that were aborted, why did he pay the five hundred pounds? Fine. The pastor should have called the sister-in-law and the man with his wife and confronted them according to Matthew 18, verse 15 to 17, which says, If your brother shall trespass against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, take one or two more with you, so that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglects to hear the church, let him be to you as a heathen and a tax collector. Matthew 18, verse 15 to 17. By paying the £500 fine, he had indirectly admitted that he was the father of those children the sister-in-law aborted. No wonder Jesus says, You have made the word of God of no effect through your tradition which you have delivered, and you do many such things. Mark 7 verse 13 as far as Jesus is concerned, I consider that pastor who suggested that counsel to him that the brother and his sister-in-law were unsaved people, for they did not even consider those abortions as murder. This has destroyed the trust that the wife once had in him. I told them, you must be born again, all of you. That is the first step. And then we will resolve everything according to the written word of God, not according to the traditions of men. 
Thirdly, Jesus tells us, you are the one who must choose your friend. Nobody should impose a friendship on you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Some people come to advise me that they want me to get close to a certain person and befriend him, as he will truly help me. They are trying to choose friends for me, and they get angry when I do not call the person they wanted me to befriend. Solomon says the righteous should choose his friends carefully, for the way of the wicked leads them astray. Proverbs 12 verse 26 I am not saying that those people they introduce me to are wicked people. Not at all. On the contrary, they are godly people who fear the Lord, and I greatly respect them in their life in ministry. But I do not feel comfortable confiding in them. I have friends who are of the age of my parents or even of my grandparents, godly people who give me advice that lines up with the written word of God. Some of them God divinely collected us, others I chose them because I respected them and felt comfortable confiding in them. Friendship is never forced upon, but chosen. I believe, according to the scriptures, friendship, like agape love, should be without hypocrisy or dissimulation. Romans 12 verse 9 The other kind of love is eros love, or the sexual love between husband and wife. God is the one who created sex, not the devil. The devil perverted it. In the Garden of Eden, God placed Adam and Eve. They were naked and they were not ashamed. Genesis 2 verse 25 Eden means pleasure. So God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Pleasure. God gives us richly all things to enjoy, including our spouse. 1 Timothy 6 verse 17 there is romance in Eros' love, as we can see it in the life of Isaac and Rebecca, as it is written. Now it came to pass, when Isaac had been in the land of the Philistines a long time, that Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, looked through the window and saw, there was Isaac showing endearment to Rebekah his wife, or caressing Rebekah his wife, or playing with Rebekah his wife. And Abimelech called Isaac and said, Quite obviously she is your wife, so how could you say that she is your sister? Isaac said to him, Because I said, Lest I die on account of her. Genesis 26 verse 8 to 9 so imitate Isaac in his love towards Rebekah. You cannot compare storage love with Eros love. The love that you have for your sister and the love you have for your wife. The love you have for your brother and the love you have for your husband. If you start romancing your brother or your sister, people will be so angry because you are acting inappropriately. It is incest. There are Christians who do not know that they are acting inappropriately towards some Christian sisters. They are not married to them, but they are caressing or showing endearment in public to a sister. This ought not to be. Paul says, This I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare on you, but for that which is right, and that you may attend on the Lord without destruction. But, if anyone thinks it behaving himself indecently towards his virgin, if she is past her prime and so it ought be, let him do what he will. He does not sin. Let them marry. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 35 to 36 If you are acting indecently toward a sister or a brother, your conscience will be accusing you and your heart will be condemning you. Romans 2 verse 15 and 1 John 3 verse 19 to 21. And we know that if our heart condemns us and our conscience accuses us, we no longer have confidence when we pray to receive from the Lord whatever we ask Him. 1 John 5 verse 14 to 15. 
The devil bombards our conscience with accusations, for he is the accuser of the brethren, Revelation 12 verse 10. As we saw in the Bible study on the power of confession, the devil is after our confidence so that we will not get our prayers answered and sick people will die, people will stay in bondage to the devil. That is why Paul tells us, This I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare on you, but for that which is right, and that you may attend on the Lord without distraction. What you are doing is not evil per se, but it has an appearance of evil. The devil wants to distract us with his accusations and condemnations so that we will be ineffective in healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out devils, cleansing lepers. Paul advises us, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 21 to 23 When you read the book of Songs of Solomon, you will see how the Shulamite plays with her beloved. See how they talk to each other. Read that book to see how God is romantic and apply it in your marriage. See how Father Jacob knew how to cook. The lentils that he cooked were so tasty that Esau sold his birthright over that stew. Genesis 25 verse 29 to 34. Jesus himself also was a great cook. In John 21, when the disciples went fishing, he was at the shore broiling fish for the disciples. John 21 verse 9 to 10. Learn from Jesus and Father Jacob. The last form of love is epithumio love or lust. Lust is of the devil. Jesus says, I say to you that whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Matthew 5 verse 28. It is what pushes people to commit all sexual immorality, adultery, fornication, incest, paedophilia, homosexuality, rape, etc. It is the devil that is behind lust. The devil has been deceiving people that lust is eros love. No. God is a most romantic person. If you want romance in your marriage, study the Bible. All the sins committed in lust send a person into hell. So why should anybody want to have lust in his or her life? It is deadly. James explains it saying, Let no one being tempted say, I am tempted from God. For God is not tempted by evils and he tempts no one. But each one is tempted by his lusts being drawn away and seduced by them. Then, when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is fully formed, brings forth death. James 1 verse 13 to 15 So lust is not God putting that in the heart of anyone but the devil. This I say then, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5 verse 16 We know what commands we gave you by the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, for you to abstain from fornication, adultery, and all sexual immorality, each one of you to know how to possess his vessel, in sanctification and honor, not in the passion of lust, even as the nations who do not know God. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 2 to 5 Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Hebrews 13 verse 4 To be continued